Thank you for joining us today for Spraying Dependency Injection Styles with Chris Bean, Senior Technical Staff Engineer with the Spring Source Division of VMware. Now I'd like to introduce Chris Bean. I'm a Senior Staff Engineer with Spring Source. I'm a member of the Core Spring team. That means that I'm someone who commits to the Core Spring code base, fixes the bugs that you put in, all that kind of thing. Uh, I've also previously for Spring Source been a trainer and consultant, which means that I would travel around primarily the U.S. and uh, training uh, individuals, training teams, doing consulting on how to best use Spring. And I'm also the co-author of a forthcoming book by O'Reilly, Spring in a Nutshell. A little bit about you, assumptions that I'm going to make about you given a limited uh, time format today. I'll assume that you have at least some familiarity with what dependency injection is, why you'd care, why it's useful, why it's become so popular over the last years in the Java and beyond the Java world. Uh, I'll assume you have some experience with Spring. You've seen a Spring XML file, touched one, maintained one at the very least. And uh, that you have at least some experience with um, Java 5 language features, especially annotations. We'll be talking a lot about annotations and there won't be a sidebar to explain uh, how they work or what they are. Let's get right to it. Dependency injection. It's a very, very simple concept, right? Maybe even a revolutionarily simple concept when Spring first came around. If we have components in a Java application like a transfer service and it depends on another component, i.e. it interacts with another component or another object at runtime, like account repository, or you might call that account DAO, some data access artifact, let's say, there's clearly a relationship between them. There's a code relationship between those two objects. So we would express that in Java perhaps like this. Right? The transfer service constructor takes an account repository collaborator or object, or that object gets injected as a dependency through the constructor. This really is as simple as dependency injection can be. Dependency injection is that simple. Right? Whether it's through a constructor or through a setter, these are details. But the idea is the transfer service shouldn't have to look up that dependency. It shouldn't have to do a JNDI lookup or a service locator lookup or a singleton lookup or any of that kind of thing. Right? Very, very, very simple. You could say dependency injection is object orientation as it was meant to be. So if it's so simple, then why are there so many choices? Why are there so many ways to do it? Right? Today in spring and from day one in spring we've had of course, the Beans namespace, Bean declarations in XML, at configurable, this is uh, domain object dependency injection. We have uh, context annotation config and component scanning that came along in Spring 2.5. Along with that came auto wired. We're going to see all that coming up. At inject is a new player on the scene, part of JSR 330. We'll also talk about that. At configuration classes and at Bean methods. That's new in Spring 3, right? And the list could go on, right? This is just a partial list of all of the choices, all the different mechanisms that help you get dependency injection done. So why so many choices? First, let's pare it down, narrow it down into what I'll call three fundamental dependency injection styles that Spring offers. The first one, obviously, is XML-based. That's what most everybody knows. And the beans namespace is where bean declarations happen, where dependency injection occurs, et cetera. There's also Spring XML namespaces, like the context, transaction, AOP, Java EE namespaces, and so on. We'll also talk about those, and we'll also talk about the fact that when we discuss Spring XML, we're not strictly talking about dependency injection, especially when we talk about the namespaces. This goes beyond dependency injection into container configuration and into application configuration many other concerns to think about than just dependency injection. Then there's annotation-based configuration, annotation-based dependency injection with at component and auto-wired and also now at inject. And then Java-based configuration, which of course it's still using annotations, but we say Java-based because where the actual dependency injection happens is going to be in a Java class, what we call configuration classes. Again, new in Spring 3. So we'll cover each one of these and we'll cover them in a way where we look at them against a set of criteria, like a criteria of what matters when you're choosing a dependency injection style. Give them a little bit of a scorecard at the end. We'll take a hands-on live coded tour through each one so you have a sense of what it's all about. 
And we'll talk about mixing and matching dependency injection styles because in a non-trivial application, that's not just probably going to be necessary, it's also probably desired. There really isn't one silver bullet. There's no one magic tool or just simply said best way to do dependency injection. Different aspects of the application may need different considerations and therefore different DI styles. I'll also talk briefly about what's coming in Spring 3.1 and beyond for uh, what we're thinking about next for dependency injection features in Spring. And then the code that you'll see me walking through, you can sync up to that yourself. You can clone it from a Git repository at GitHub. If you're not familiar with Git or you just haven't used it yet or what have you, when you go to that link, you'll see the readme is displayed right there and just describes everything you need to do. You also don't need to furiously write down that URL because I'll put it up again at the end of the presentation. And as mentioned, um, this recorded presentation and the slides that you're looking at will be made available to you after the presentation. Let's talk about these four characteristics of a dependency injection style. Four very simple axes on which to make a decision. And you know, when we look at these, they're so simple, right? Like ease of use, maintainability, flexibility, portability. I think that when you hear any group of developers, spring developers in an office or in a team, and they're discussing which way should we do it with Spring? Which way should we do dependency injection? XML, annotations, et cetera. They're probably having that conversation inside of one of these or multiple of these buckets. They're talking about ah, annotations are just so much easier. Yeah, yeah, but XML gives us this centralized artifact, that kind of thing. So hopefully these categories, these characteristics capture all of those, what the sort of scorecard for XML looks like, right? When it comes to ease of use, an XML-based syntax does mean that you're outside of your Java editor, right, which is the number one complaint that people have. Usually people complaining about this are not actually dedicated Spring users. Certainly some Spring users really just don't like XML, but for the most part, when people find that they have proper tooling around it, it becomes less of an issue. Okay, now you may just not want XML. We'll get to all of that and how we solve that and how we can have a completely Java-based um, situation. But you could call that a, a, a red mark for ease of use, right? It is XML-based. Um, when it comes to maintainability, XML really shines, right? There's a centralized artifact. You've got this blueprint view of the application. The Spring XML configuration is extremely widely understood in the Java community, and that means maintainability, right? But the compiler can't catch errors, so as that you know, project is evolving over time and changing over time, that can be a maintainability issue. If not everybody knows how to use the tooling property properly, et cetera, you can have a breaking application long after the CI process, perhaps, the continuous integration process. Flexibility, right? You can configure anything you want in XML. If you have a very complicated object, you might need to use a spring factory beam that you configure in XML. But XML is quite flexible, which is a strength. And then portability, because XML is an external style and it's non-invasive, that means that your POJO classes remain pure POJOs and they remain portable across dependency injection frameworks. Okay, you should be able to see my screen now. I'll assume that if no one speaks up, that you can. So what I was just looking at, and you can refer back to this slide, once you have the slides yourself, was this, this kind of scorecard for XML as a style, which takes us to annotation-based DI, right? Also called sometimes annotation-driven injection. This came along in Spring 2.5. We enhanced it, rounded it out in Spring 3.0 by adding essentially more annotations. And really, these annotations match up with everything that's possible in XML. So for example, you can have a bean definition in XML that's marked as lazy. You can now have at lazy on your components that are marked up with spring annotations. So that's just about feature parity, what we did in spring 3.0 there. Since it was released in 2.5, which is now years ago, we've seen it gain quite a bit of popularity. Lots and lots of folks use spring auto wiring to good effect, especially in certain parts of the application. Like if you build spring MVC based web applications, it's very likely that you use annotation based controllers. The productivity benefits there are quite considerable compared to a pure XML-based route, which is why people go with it. So let's, let's see about the time. I'm going to forego the demos and see if we have some time to do that at the end. I'm really sorry we can't fit those in. 
due to the due to due to the lag. But let's see if we can fit in all the content first. So JSR 330 is a Java specification request that we Spring Source and Google entered into and put through the JCP, the Java community process, to see about standardizing annotations for, de for dependency injection. And the reason for this is that if you're using annotations like components and auto-wired and so on, those are spring annotations, right, which means that they're, uh, if you will, invading themselves or infecting themselves into your Pojo classes. The downsides of doing that actually aren't so great because uh, even if you have an org spring framework auto-wired import in your POJO classes, that POJO really is still a POJO, plain old Java object, for all the purposes that you care for it to be. For example, your tests will still work. You can still unit test something that has a spring annotation in it. You can still port it across different environments, right? It's not bound to a framework at runtime in any way. It's bound to a framework at code time. That's quite a different thing. So Spring's annotations are invasive, but we can see that they're minimally invasive. Nevertheless, nevertheless, it's a good goal not to have any org spring framework imports in your classes in your in your component classes whatsoever. Ergo, JSR three thirty. So the idea is find out what's the lowest common denominator, what's truly common across frameworks like Juice, across frameworks like Spring, and produce a standard set of annotations. It's been available since late last year, Spring 3.0, GA passed the technology compatibility kit, right, so you can use this stuff today. And this is what, is, this is what that JSR consists of. It's really, really simple, right, just five types, five annotations, excuse me, and an interface. And you can see the mapping between Spring's auto-wired annotation, for example, and Java X inject, inject annotation, right? The semantics between those two annotations are quite similar. So you'd be putting add inject on your constructors, on your setters, et cetera. You'd be marking your classes as component, right? Marking them for component scanning. You can do that with component in Spring. You can do that with add named in Java X inject. Right. And on down the line. But as you can see, there's not a perfect one-to-one -one match. For example, the value annotation. If you want to inject a value, say, from a properties file, you can do that in Spring, but you can't do that in Java X inject. It's simply not specified. So you might achieve a kind of 80-20 crossover of maybe 80% of the things that you need for annotation-based injection can be done by JSR 330 annotation. That other 20% more advanced stuff, the things that JSR 330 just simply doesn't cover, you would drop down and use spring annotations. 